Amen. Well, good morning. If you have a Bible, open to Exodus chapter 20. If you're visiting this morning, we are currently in a series going through the 10 commandments. And we're going to be looking at the fourth one this morning regarding the Sabbath. So Exodus chapter 20. As you guys are turning there, how many of you have seen the movie Chariots of Fire? Right? It's an amazing movie. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you watching it, even tonight with your family. It's a true story about two British runners competing in the 1924 Olympics. Eric Liddell, a devout Christian, who called, uh, his calling was to run in God's name. Another runner, Harold Abrahams, who simply ran for personal glory and fame for himself. Well, in the movie, on the the boat to the Paris Olympics, Liddell finds out that to compete in the 100-meter run, which was as strong as he was favored to win, that he would have to do qualifying races on Sunday, which for him was the Sabbath. So when he heard that, he decided that he wasn't going to run. He wasn't going to run that race. He wasn't going to run the qualifying races on Sunday. He was pressured by his government to run. They sat him down and tried to pressure him because he was considered one of the best. And this is what he said. I'm afraid there are no ways, sir. I won't run on the Sabbath. And that's final. God made countries and God makes the kings and the rules by which they govern. And those rules say that the Sabbath is his and I, for one, intend to keep it that way. So that Sunday when the race happened, he was worshiping in a Paris church. He was actually speaking and he was preaching from the text Isaiah 40. Those who wait upon the Lord shall Renew their strength. They shall mount up wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Pretty powerful scene. Later in the Olympics, Liddell competes in the 400 meter, which he never ran. He never trained for that. He wasn't favored to win. And surprisingly, not only did he win, but he broke the world record. Pretty an amazing story. But here's the question Did Liddell make the right choice? Would it have been sinful for him to run on Sunday? None of the Ten Commandments generate more controversy than the one we're going to be studying today. Remember the Sabbath day. It seems like a simple enough command, and yet it raises all sorts of questions that you have maybe asked or had to answer. Wasn't the Sabbath just for the Jews? What if I have to work on Sundays? Am I sinning before God? Well, which day is the Sabbath? Is it Saturday or is it Sunday? Aren't we under grace, not law? Well, I'm excited this morning because we're going to be answering these questions. But while at the same time seeing God's heart for you and for me, no matter who you are, and what is God's heart from the Old Testament to the New Covenant, that we would have a proper balance between work, worship, and rest, and most importantly, that we would understand true rest comes through his Son, Jesus Christ. So let's dive in. Exodus 20, starting at verse 8, we're going to read the fourth command. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, your cattle, your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. If you're new here, on the back of the apple with today, there's a sermon outline. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. So I want to encourage you to use that to take notes and write down verses if you want to go back and look at them in more depth. But the big idea of the sermon this morning, we're going to see Christ's sacrifice on the cross invites us to enter into his rest and find true peace in him. What was the Sabbath pointing to? It was a sign. It was pointing to Jesus and ultimate rest that is going to be found when this world ends, if you have faith in Jesus Christ. So if you're filling in the first point, exploring the roots of the Sabbath commandment, let's begin here. Remember week one, before we even got into this series, many people break up the commandments in two sections. They were broken up in two tablets. The first four commands are theocentric, 
Remember, we talked about that. What does that mean, Pastor Derek? They define our relationship with God, how we worship him, how we relate to him. And then the commands 5 through 10 are anthropocentric. They have to do with our relationship with man and others and each other. So since this is the last commandment regarding how we are to worship God, we've already learned we are to worship him alone. We are to have no images, no idols. We are not to take his name in vain, not only with our words, but with our actions as well. And here the last one, today we are to work six days and commit one day to rest and worship him. Look at verse eight. Underline that first word, remember. This is a strong command in the Hebrew. It's an infinite absolute. It's to call to mind, to contemplate, to think about in a way that changes behavior. So God is saying, hey, remember, think about this. And then what does he call them to remember? He says, remember the Sabbath. Now, believe it or not, many people think the Sabbath means seventh or seven. That's not, that is not what it means. Sabbath means a day of ceasing, to cease, the day of resting, to stop working. So here, God is saying to Israelite as he's doing this new covenant, this Mosaic covenant, as he's giving the law, right in the middle of it, he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to work six days, and I want you to take one one day off to rest and worship me. So what's the rhythm? Everyone say six and one. Six and one. Now, The Israelites, when they would have heard this from God, they would have been familiar with this rhythm. Why? This is significant. This is the only commandment that God had already introduced to them. Remember, in Exodus 16, when they were on their way to Mount Sinai, after God delivered them from the Egyptians, and God is supernaturally providing food for them, what does God say? He says, for six days, get up early, Gather food, enjoy it for the day, but on the sixth day, I want you to take double because on the seventh day, I don't want you to work. I don't want you to rest. I will provide food on the sixth day to get through the seventh. Exodus 16, just to remind you of the language. He said to them, this is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, And all that is left over put aside to be kept until the morning. So we know God has already been establishing this rhythm, six and one, six and one. But here in Exodus 20, God provides even a stronger reason for this rhythm. And what's that reason? It's himself. And it's how he created the world. Look at verse 11. He commands them to do this rhythm. And he says, for in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So here, with this commandment, he doesn't do it with the rest of them. He gives reasoning. Why do I want you to do this? Because I do it, God is saying. This is the rhythm that I have been establishing from the very beginning. God created the world, everything, in six 24-hour days. No, it did not take millions of years or billions of years. It took six days, 24-hour days. It was finished and it was completed. And what did God do on the seventh day? He rested and he blessed it and he made it holy. And when you think of God resting, it's, be, it's not because God is tired or he's weary. We know Isaiah 40, 28, our everlasting God, the Lord, our creator, the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. So it's not because he was tired or weary that he rested. So why did he rest on the seventh day? Because it was completed, it was finished. And what does he say? After looking at all of it, he says, Dennis, it is good. Done. And then it's interesting because he makes the seventh day holy. You can underline that. This is the first time in Genesis just the word holy is used in the Bible. It means set apart, dedicated, or consecrated for a holy purpose. So here, God, the seventh day is set apart. It's dedicated for a holy purpose, to rest and to worship, and it's a special memorial of his creation. He says, from the very beginning. So you can picture God speaking to the Israelites as they're his people. He called them by grace. He delivered them. And now he wants them to love him. 
And he wants them to be like him and to represent him. And you think of God as he's teaching them the laws. He knows what's best. And he's telling them, I created you. Trust me and have this six to one rhythm. Now, recently I got the owner manual for my car. How many of you ever read through yours? Raise hands if you ever read this. How many know where it's even at? All right, all right, some of you better. I must confess, never read this thing. But I open up and I want to read something it says. Talking about maintenance. Regular maintenance, maintenance is essential to obtaining the highest level of performance, safety, reliability from your car. This booklet is designed to help you make sure that your vehicle receives proper and timely maintenance. Follow the booklet's recommendation and you will enjoy maximum reliability and peace of mind from your vehicle for many years to come. Doesn't that sound great? The creators of this car put together a book saying, we created this, we know how it can operate at optimum levels, read the book, listen to us, trust us, and everything's going to be great. How many do that? And here's where God is getting at in Exodus 20. What is he saying? He's saying to them, to us this morning, he's saying, I made you, I know you, I knit you together in your mother's womb, and I know the rhythm that will ensure for you to live a peaceful, productive life, worshiping me and glorifying me. And what is that rhythm? It's six and one. So it's interesting that God uses the creation account to command them to live and obey the Sabbath, a certain rhythm, but then he's going to unpack it and give them more detail. Second point, if you're filling in the blanks, is this. Understanding the significance and purpose behind the Sabbath commandment. Look at verse 10. He says, The seventh day is the Sabbath, your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male, your female servant, or your cattle, your sojourner who stays with you. So God gives them very specific instructions. Now, the Jews take this and run with it. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But here's basically the simple instruction. One day a week, rest from your work, your labor. No plowing, no harvesting. Simply rest from work. Why? Because God desired for this to be a blessing to them. The Sabbath was never meant to be a burden, a yoke where I can't walk, I can't brush my teeth, I can't do anything. This was supposed to be a blessing. And what does God want them to do? To rest, to worship, and to trust him that they could take one day off a week and guess what? They're going to be fine that God will sustain them. So in this, do you see the heart of God? He's saying, love me, trust me, let go, and be different from everyone else. Now pause here. Think of how awesome this would have felt. Keep in mind, they were enslaved for over 400 years to the Egyptians. What do we know about the Egyptians? There was no days off. They thought part of working every day and producing for Egypt and the Egyptian way of life, that that was pleasing the gods. Don't take any days off. Keep sweating. Keep working. Keep sweating. Keep working. So here God shows up and says, wait a minute. I'm not like those false gods. I'm a different God. And I care about you. And I care about your heart towards me. And I want there to be a day where you rest, you trust me, and you worship me. You focus on me and you remember me. And that's where he gets the next thing. It's not just resting, but it's a day for rest and worship. Everyone say worship. We miss this. No matter all the false talk and misunderstanding about the Sabbath, a lot of people, it's all about rest. Okay, that's part of it, but there's a big piece to this. And it's to worship God. God is not giving them an excuse to be lazy, God is not saying, hey, I'm going to give you one day where you can do nothing and sleep in all day. He's not saying, hey, I'm going to give you one day where you can play video games all day. That's not what his heart and his tension is. No, they are to worship him in a special way where he is the focus of that day. This is really significant. And if you're filling in the second point, there's different ways in the Bible we see that God wanted them to worship him in special ways. 
What's the first? They were to have a special worship gathering. Leviticus 23, listen to this. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. You shall not do any work. It is the Sabbath to the Lord in your dwelling. So you should have a holy convocation. What does that mean? There should be a holy gathering, corporate worship on the Sabbath, and we see that in the Old Testament. They are to have to give special offerings of worship on the Sabbath. Numbers 28, listen to this. Then on the Sabbath day, two male lambs, one year old without the t- defect, and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour, mixed with oil as a grain offering and its drink offering. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath in addition to the continual burnt offerings and its drink offering. So here you see God's heart. It's not just sleep in all day and do nothing. It's worship together and then give other offerings on the Sabbath that you are called to do. But it doesn't end there. They are to have special remembrance. Deuteronomy 5. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of there to be a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. In Deuteronomy, when God repeats the commandments, it's a different perspective. And what does he say? That day I want you to have a special time where you remember what? Not just creation, not just my provision, but I want you to remember my deliverance, that you were enslaved and I showed up because I heard your cries and I let you go. And now the freedom that you have is because of me. So take some time every Sabbath and just remember your deliverance. But they are also to have a special fear of the Sabbath, a healthy fear. Exodus 31, for six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest. Holy to the Lord, whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely put to death. What what was the consequence if you broke the Sabbath? Death. Death. Talk about fear. It's like, all right, God is saying, listen, this is significant. Why? Because I know your hearts are so quick to wander. I know your hearts are so quick to be like all the other nations. I know your heart is so quick to look to yourself to provide. And I want you to pause, and I want your heart to just be focused on me because I love you, and I want you to love me. This is God's desire. So it was not just important that they obey God. But even the Sabbath, that they did it with the right heart, this is unbelievable. There's examples of God rebuking them because they're doing it, but they're doing it with the wrong heart. Amos chapter 8, the prophet says this. He's speaking to the person who has a bad heart towards the Sabbath. And he says, hear this, you who trample the needy to do away with the humble of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain again? And the Sabbath, that we may open the wheat market to make the bushel smaller and shekel bigger and to cheat with dishonest scales. These were the people saying, man, the Sabbath is dumb. When will the sun rise so we can get back to work? And God speaks to that person and says, whoa, check your hearts. Now I want to pause here for a moment because it's important to understand also what's happening. God is giving the law. He's he's beginning this Mosaic covenant with the people now. And all throughout scripture, God is going to say, the Sabbath is a sign of the Mosaic covenant. And all throughout scripture, when God makes a new covenant, there's a sign. Here's a quiz. When God made a covenant with Noah that he would never destroy the world, what was the sign? Good job. When God made a covenant with Abraham, what was the sign? Circumcision. God's making a covenant with Moses. What's the sign? Sabbath. Ezekiel 20.20. He says this, keep my Sabbaths holy that they may be a sign between us 
that people know you, that I am your God. So God is saying, I'm setting you apart. This is a sign that you're my people, just like circumcision was, Sabbath keeping now, where all, all the nations are gonna look to you and understand that you take a day off, that you're different. Why would you do this? Why would you take a day off just to worship? And think of the testimony of God's character and God's grace when people see the Israelites doing this that they stood out from the other nations, they stood out from the other cultures, they stood out from the other tribes, and this is a good sign. God desires for them to be set apart. That's all through the Old Testament, that they wouldn't just blend in, and no matter who you are this morning, listen, if you're in Christ, God has that same desire. He freed you from slavery of sin to set you apart, that you and I would be different from the world, that people would look at your life and look at people in the world's life and there would be a radical difference just like God's desire for the Israelites and the other nations. Friends, that we wouldn't fit into the rest of the world. Then what is one of those differences even today that we would set apart time in our week to rest and to worship God? We live in a culture that worships work and wealth. I mean, it's our culture. People brag about how much they were. Well, in 30 years, I've never had a day off. We celebrate that. We worship entertainment and sports, setting apart time. Instead of worshiping God, now we use our free time for entertainment and sports. And we look around, and we spe- especially it's, it's a unique season Used to be the world just said, hey, weekends are for sports. Now you have people saying, hey, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm born again. And yet they're like the world when it comes to sports and recreation. There's no time in their schedule for worship. May we stand out because it makes a difference. People notice What comes to your mind when you think about a business taking a stand and not working on Sundays? Yeah. How many want to sing this Chick-fil-A song by Tim Hawkins? Anyone know it? Matt, you know it? (laughs) You can Google it. All right, later today, not now. (laughs) The world knows what about Chick-fil-A, that they, they are putting some time in to worship or to have rest. We're going to get to that the Sabbath is, is not binding anymore, but I pray that this idea of being set apart for rest and worship is a characteristic of all of our lives, where they look at your life and my life and they see we're not wrapped up in the rat race in this world, that we're different. And this gets us to our last point. God uses creation to command us a certain rhythm. He gives us clarity of what our week should be like. And now we're going to see, lastly, that everything changed in the new covenant. As you look at these Ten Commandments, as we go through the rest of them these next couple months, unlike the rest of the Ten Commandments, remembering the Sabbath is the only commandment not to get repeated in the New Testament. All the other commands are repeated in various ways in multitude of places and expanded on, but not the command to to remember the Sabbath. Why? When you come to the New Testament and you come to the New Covenant, there's no prescriptions of Sabbath rules anywhere. There's no instructions to keep the Sabbath. In Acts 15, when the Jerusalem Council decided they were meeting to decide what do they require Gentiles, believers to do, they did not require them to observe the Sabbath. Or the Mosaic law. And Jesus comes into this world and he lives a perfect life and he dies on the cross and he's buried and he rises again. And at that moment, everything changed. We go from the old covenant to this new covenant where Christ fulfilled all the Old Testament ceremonial laws. Everything changed at that moment when the new covenant was established. The physical temple now is gone. We're the temple. The sacrificial system of Judaism is gone. There's one sacrifice, final, it's over. The feasts and the celebrations, they're gone. And the Sabbath requirement also 
gone. Why? Because we have something better. We have someone who will give true ultimate rest, not just one day a week, but for all of eternity. And what was his name? His name is Jesus, and he is the substance that the shadows all pointed to. And think about this time when you read the Gospels. How did Jesus interact with the Sabbath? It was mostly negative. Why? Because the Jews took something that was good and they distorted it. They made it something God had never intended it to be. Instead of simply taking a day to rest and to worship and glorify God, they created 39 different categories of work that was prohibited and they would just yoke people with this piano heaviness of laws on their back. If you were a tailor, you could not even carry your needles home or you broke the Sabbath. Where is that? You could not walk further than a mile or you broke the Sabbath. Where is that? So Jesus comes in and he's just thinking, where all these rules come from? The Sabbath is supposed to be a blessing. It's supposed to point to me, ultimate rest, and instead you're using it to legalistically bind people up. And there's many examples of this. One of the clearest ones, everyone write down Matthew 12. Read it sometime today. Jesus is walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath. The disciples are hungry, so they're picking grain. They're hungry. They're working hard. And the Pharisees saw this. He accuses Jesus. They accuse Jesus and the disciples of breaking the Sabbath. How does Jesus respond? He says, have you not read the scriptures? Do you not understand that David and his companions ate consecrated bread and it was okay? Do you not understand that priests still had to work on Sunday because of all the gatherings and it was okay? And Jesus says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What is he saying? It's about worshiping me and it's about trusting in me and it's about trusting in this rest that I'm gonna go to the cross and spill my blood to give you. It's not about just resting one day. That one day was to look forward to all of eternity. Friends, where you and I get to rest And when does that start? The moment you accept Christ. What do you rest from? At that moment, already, not yet, you have entered into eternal rest. You don't have to worry anymore. You can rest from worry. Where if your life ends today, you know where you're going. Why? Because Jesus was sufficient and paid it all. We can rest from works. We don't have to try to work and earn our love and obey all these rules and these commandments to try to earn God's brownie point. The moment you accept Christ, there is a rest where you understand that the work needed to have eternal life, Christ paid in full. Now he's saying, work for me because you love me and you believe it. Gives us rest from worry, rest from works. Give you rest from the world. I don't know how many of you were watching the TV last night. Doesn't it just get old? You almost get numb to the violence and the evil. And here, the good news this morning, if you're in Christ, even right now, it's not wait till then. It's right now already that we can experience this rest. What's the rest? That this world is not our home. We are just passing by. And the more things that happen, more violence, more assassination attempts, more anything, what does it do? It proves that this is real. Amen? And we can rest knowing that one day it's all going to end. I hope you rested well last night. Because God is in control. B.B. Warfield said this. That Sunday, that Lord's Day, Christ took the Sabbath into the grave with him. And brought the Lord's Day out of the grave with him and the resurrection morning. One of the biggest changes when Jesus rose from the dead was that the day of rest and worship changed From the seventh day, Saturday, to the first day, Sunday. Sunday is when Jesus rose from the dead, purchasing our eternal rest for everyone who believes. Sunday is the day the disciples were gathered when Jesus appeared to them. Sunday is the day in Pentecost the Holy Spirit descended upon our land. Sunday is the day the church met and broke bread. Sunday, all throughout Paul's letters, is when the church gathered. And Sunday in Revelation 1.10, guess what it's called? The Lord's Day. 
Well, Pastor Derek, I'm not just convinced yet that we're not under the Sabbath. Okay. Two more scriptures. Colossians 2. Starting at verse 6. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or, or a Sabbath day. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Paul is writing to this church and says, listen, stop judging one another. If some people are observing the Sabbath still, let them. It's fine. But they're going to mature to understand the, sa- the Sabbath was a shadow pointing to Christ and he's come. Just like he says with food. In Romans 14, similarly, listen to this. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. Paul is speaking to believers in Rome. He's speaking to a mixed audience, Jews and Gentiles, And what does he say? If your conscience tells you to continue to observe the Sabbath, you are more welcome to do so. Rest and worship God. It's a good thing. But notice what he does not say. This would have been a perfect time for him to say, listen, if you're not doing it, shape up and continue to do it. And he doesn't. He says, if your conscience says do it, do it. It's a good thing. But you're not commanded because Christ is the new covenant. He's fulfilled that. Just like you don't do sacrifices in the temple anymore. And again, if you're here and you're still just, hey, I'm trying to understand. Listen, the apostles never commanded anyone to observe Sabbath. They never chastised anyone for not observing the Sabbath. They never warned believers about Sabbath violations. And they never encouraged believers to hold to the Sabbath in the New Testament. There's no Sabbath mandate given to this new covenant church. And it was never imposed on any Gentile believers. So what? What? What do we do with this church? If Christ fulfilled it, what do we do? I want to end with four just positive applications from my heart, hopefully, to yours. That this is how we would lead our families. This is the type of church we would be. All right? So here's the so what. May we strive for proper balance of worship, work, and rest in our lives. Even though the Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ, it's a great principle. It goes back to creation. And it's something that's always been good. To have a day of rest and to worship. And I pray that whatever rhythm we find, that we would at least see that and try to live in a way that stands out from the world. That's number one. Number two. What's one thing that's the same in the Old and New Covenant? Set aside time each week for public worship. In the Old Testament, the Sabbath was the day to worship God. In In the New Testament, Sunday, the Lord's Day, what do we do? Praise. Turn the person next to you and say, kudos, you're here this morning. There's a lot of places you could be, and you're here doing what? Saying, Lord, I want to worship you because of who you are. Keep fighting for that, friends. Church is the excuse for us to miss everything else. Amen? Number three. Reflect on the five purposes given in Scripture for the Sabbath. Reflect on that. It was a time of rest and refreshment. It was a sign that you belonged to God. It was a special day for worship. It was a way to show your trust for God's provision. And it always pointed to God's redemption through Christ. Focus on those things. One day a week, focus on them. And here's the last thing, and I feel like our church does a great job, but help us continue it. Avoid the extremes. Avoid the extreme where, hey, business as usual, we don't have to be set apart from the world, we can do whatever we want. That's one extreme. But avoid the other extreme where there's a legalistic observance where you're preaching to people and putting yokes on them that have been released and paid in full through Christ. So I want to end this morning with this. May you hear these words from your Savior, your Redeemer, your Shepherd, your King. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light.